Welcome to another day of quarantine. Hope you're all doing well. I have all this time on my hands, so I'm going to do the unimaginable. I honestly don't even know how much of this menu I know, but I have the instruction manual pulled up next to me. So if we need to look stuff up, we will. Just look at this menu though. Oh my God, how many items is this? How long is this video going to be? Have I bitten off more than I can chew? Looks like it. I am f Shall we just get started? Let's do it. I'm gonna throw the screen right here in the corner so you guys can follow along. File format, RAW and JPEG. I usually just shoot both and I actually lower the quality of the JPEG. I just use the JPEGs for reference and then I edit the RAW is my personal workflow. But honestly, I'm not a photographer. I don't really take that many pictures. I don't think I've taken a single picture on this camera yet. Yeah, not, not one. <laughs> I'm a video guy, so I usually just gloss over half this menu here. But I would like to know this stuff and I have nothing better to do with my time, so let's just keep going. Aspect ratio of the photos, three by two is pretty traditional. 16 by nine is what I like because that's the aspect ratio of the videos. And usually if I'm taking a picture, it's for a thumbnail. So I like to have it 16 by nine, so it frames well for a thumbnail. And also one by one, if you're shooting for like Instagram, you want to square one by one. So there you go. There's one by one right there. But again, 16 by nine, so that should fill out this frame perfectly. Yeah, and then if I were to go to three by two, that's gonna give me some borders on the sides. So 16 by nine for my use. Long exposure, noise reduction, actually something I had to look up. So every time you go over a second, on your shutter speed, then now you are in long exposure mode. So when you have noise reduction on, obviously it reduces the noise from your photo. However, it takes double the amount of time to take the photo because it essentially takes a secondary photo and uses that data to get a map of the noise to remove it. So if it's a one second photo, it's only gonna take an extra second. So two seconds to take the photo, not a big deal. But if you do a 30 second exposure, then instead of it taking only 30 seconds to take the photo, it's gonna take a whole minute so depends on what you're trying to do. If you have the time, maybe use it. If you don't, then turn it off. And then high ISO noise reduction, there's normal, low, and off. It does say you could turn it off to prioritize the timing of shooting. And it also says it doesn't affect the raw images, so I'm just gonna ignore that. Color space, I have it on sRGB. You could also switch it to Adobe RGB, but I believe this only affects the JPEGs, not really the raw. Technically, Adobe RGB is a larger color space, but I think they said that's the most commonly encountered color issue is when people mix up sRGB and Adobe RGB, so sRGB is fine. Lens compensation, all right, we have shading, chromatic aberration, and distortion. Shading comp, is that like vignetting? So shading comp is whether to automatically compensate for dark in the corners of the screen. So yeah, I think it is like vignetting. Basically, when the corners of the screen get dark, it'll compensate for that. A lot of lenses you attach have information on how to correct its imperfections, so that communicates to the camera and fixes it right there on the spot. Moving on is scene selection. So now I have the camera itself itself set to scene mode. And I think these are kind of like smart modes, like portraits, basically blurring away the background more, reproduces soft skin tones, um, macro shots, landscapes, sunsets, which will vividly express and dramatically capture the redness of dusk and dawn. Anti-motion blur, so reduces blur when shooting indoors with poor lighting. So it takes a series of photos and then composites it into one photo. That's kind of cool to see some smart features coming into these mirrorless cameras. But some of these smart modes take away the ability to shoot raw, so careful when using them. So drive mode, of course, we have single shooting and then we have continuous shooting on high. Nice. We have self timers from two, five, and 10 seconds. And self timer continuous is actually awesome because with the self timer, you could have it take several photos. Like I've always hated setting up the self timer and then running over and then posing with everyone. It takes one photo and then like somebody's blinking, you know? So this will take three shots after 10 seconds. Oh, and you could also do some bracketing. So let's say five images at three EVs. So when I take this photo, it's gonna give me five different exposures. Let's go. Yeah, all different exposures. So you have a collection to choose from or you can merge them, make some HDR stuff. You could also bracket your white balance and DRO, what is that? DRO stands for dynamic range optimizer. So that's kind of interesting. It's like bracketing, but it just takes the photo all at once. And we can change some of the bracketing settings, including setting a self timer for the bracketing or bracketing order. So right now it starts with the exposed shots and then it shoots one under and one over. So 
switching it to this mode, we'll start from an underexposed shot, then exposed, then overexposed. Interval shooting function. So this is interesting. You can turn it on shooting start time. So it's kind of like the self timer in a way and then shooting intervals. So if you wanted to shoot every five seconds, I guess you could use this for time-lapsing too. Number of shots, you could do a couple thousand. Yeah, you could definitely do this for time-lapsing. Auto exposure tracking sensitivity. So how fast does the exposure change? So if you're doing a time-lapse, a cloud comes over, how fast will it adapt to that? Like I guess if you have it on a tripod and you're just trying to take a series of photos and you're only gonna use one of them, I'd say put it on high. But if you're doing a time-lapse and a cloud comes over, it's better to have it on low so it's not gonna drastically change too fast. You can make it silent if you want to. And then shooting interval priority, you could turn that on and it will prioritize the time for the shooting intervals over the shutter speed of the camera. So here we have memory recall and memory. So this is cool because if you have some funky settings that you like to regularly shoot in, you can save those settings right here. You can set it on one or two. Now these first two settings are settings on the dial itself, but if I go to M1, 2, 3, or 4, those settings are actually saved on the SD card. So that means when you format the memory card, it's gonna clear these out too. So I don't really see myself using those too much. I'm gonna probably utilize one and two though as much as possible. And after you save those settings, you could recall them through here or you can just turn the dial to the preset here, which is probably faster. In addition from that, you could also kind of recall it through register custom shoot sets. So basically you have these three recall custom holds that you can program in. Now the hold settings are cool because you have your settings that you're shooting on and while you're pressing down a custom button, then it switches to that mode. You can take a few shots and then when you let go, it goes back to the settings you had prior. So if you're in like a really fast changing environment, like you're shooting sports or whatever, it might actually be useful there. Oh my God, we're still in page five. <gasps> this video is gonna take so long. I already regret my decision to make this video. <sighs> I mean, how many pages are on this menu? Holy crap. We have 14 here and then nine here and more and more and more. What is that? I'm gonna do the math. 35 pages. And this has been like all photo stuff too. I'm not a photographer. Single shot autofocus. That's kind of like the default, right? So this is single point right here. Every time I half press, it finds a spot and locks it in. And then we have automatic autofocus. What is that? So basically switches between single shot and continuous depending on the movement of the subject. So it's kind of like a smart setting. So Continuous autofocus, as I hold down the shutter, it's constantly searching for new things to focus on. Then there's DMF, which is kind of like a hybrid of autofocus and manual. So I can find my focus as I would normally, but then I would turn the manual focus afterwards to make the fine adjustments. So that might be useful for super shallow depth of field focusing or macro shots. So now you can set your priorities for single point autofocus and continuous autofocus. And basically you can prioritize either the autofocus or the release of the shutter. So in autofocus, it will not take the picture until it's in focus. And then if you prioritize release, it'll take the photo, but it might not be fully in focus yet. So if you prioritize autofocus, then it won't take the picture until the focus is fully there. And then if you prioritize the release, it'll still take the picture, even if it's not as confident with the autofocus. And then of course there's a balance right there in the middle. Focus areas, wide, zone, center. I'm not even going to go through all these because I need to get this video down shorter. Focus area limit. So basically if you assign a button to to switch between the focus areas, then it's gonna just toggle through all this, which could be too many. So just disable the ones that you know you don't really wanna use. So that way you're ideally only switching through a few different focus settings instead of bunch. Switch VHAF area. No clue what that means. I am such a failure. I'm totally supposed to know all this stuff. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So basically every time you switch between this way, this way, or this way, it kind of saves the autofocus points. So let's say if I'm shooting landscape like this, I want my focus to be right there. And then if I'm shooting vertical like this, I want my focus to be over up here on the top left. So then when I switch back and forth, oh yeah, look at that. And if I turn it this way, I want it to be in the center. So now I can switch between all the different focus points that kind of get saved depending on the orientation of the camera. That's actually kind of useful. Not for me though, because I'm not really a photographer. So, you know, all this, it doesn't really apply to me at all. But hopefully you guys are like, oh, that's what I can do with my camera. Good thing I subscribed to Potato Jet. <laughs> autofocus Illuminator, that's basically that orange light that comes out. If you're shooting the dark, it kind of helps the autofocus find its position. So that is something you can set to auto or you could just shut it off face IAF set. So you can prioritize 
faces or eyes in autofocus. Yes. Autofocus with shutter. So basically half pressing the shutter for autofocus. Yes. I'll leave that off for now. Pre autofocus. What does that do? Let's find out. How about I just throw a link in the description for the manual and then we just eat some cheese and crackers while you guys read it and that'll be this video, huh? So I guess it adjusts for focus even before you press down the shutter halfway. So is it basically just always searching for focus? I guess so, cause I'm not pressing anything and it is searching for the focus. I start autofocus. Man, I don't know any of this stuff. Why do you guys even listen to me? I know nothing. <laughs> autofocus starts when you look through the electronic viewfinder. This is available when you have an A mount lens and a mount adapter, an LA EA2 or an EA4 sold separately. So it sounds like this is pretty specialty stuff here, which is why it's grayed out for me. AF area registration. So you can turn it on if you want to save a focus area, and then you could always recall that area with a custom button. You could also delete the registered AF area. AF area auto clear. So basically if I hit focus on something, those green boxes stay put. But if I have auto clear on, then it should only last for a second. So I'm still holding down the shutter, but it disappears. So display continuous autofocus area, same type of concept. It just shows me those green squares, but then if I shut it off, then I no longer see those green squares anymore. Circ of focus point. Another thing I had to look up, you can either circulate it or do not circulate. So if you have a focus point like this, as you go to the edge and go off the edge, it repeats kind of like Pac-Man, you know, you go off the screen, doo -doo 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 -doo, you go up doo -doo 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 -doo, and come out the bottom. Do not circulate, you go to the edge and you're stuck. Lame. AF micro adjustments on certain lenses. If your focus isn't perfectly hitting right, you can slightly adjust them. Most likely a setting that you'll never have to deal with. Hopefully we got exposure compensation. So if you're not shooting manual, you can have it slightly go over or underexposed. ISO settings. You can set your ISO, your ISO range. So minimum at 50. That's pretty good. 100, 2,400 is the maximum. But if you want to limit that, you can. I'll probably lock mine off right there at 12. 1800 and then ISO auto minimum shutter speed and this is really all auto settings if you shoot manual you don't have to worry about any of this stuff but what's the minimum shutter speed before it starts boosting up that ISO Moving on. Metering mode, how is it gonna expose? So this is interesting because we have a light here, monitor here, another monitor here, and then darkness. So we have multi, we have center, we have spot, entire screen, average, and then highlights. So to reserve those windows, those lights. Face priority in multi-metering. So that's kind of nice. If you see a face, do you want that to take priority for your exposure? I think in most cases, yeah. If you're in spot metering mode, you could have it meter the center or also link to the focus point. So it depends on what you're trying to do. But again, if you just shoot a manual, you can ignore all this stuff. Exposure step. So every time you turn the dial, how much does exposure change? So 0.3, you're going to have more fine increments. 0.5, you're going to have bigger jumps, but I'll leave mine at 0.3. AEL with shutter speed. That stands for auto exposure lock. So when you hit the shutter, does it lock the exposure on, off, or auto? Exposure standard adjustment, something that most of us don't need to care about. Essentially baselining your exposure, but even on the menu, it says generally adjustment is not necessary. So let's ignore that. And then we have flash. You know, I know I said that I was going to go over every single thing, but let's just kind of skip the flash stuff for me. And that's just, <sighs> there's too much stuff in this. There's red eye reduction, which will flash the strobe before the picture is taken to reduce red eye. Oh man, we made it through the first 10 pages. I need to take a break. I'm going to take a nap. All right. So you, uh, I'll be back. And we're back and I got my coffee, which is a necessity for this kind of thing. But shall we continue? We made it 10 pages in yesterday, almost all about photography, but I feel like the video stuff is coming very soon. Let's get that screen back up and let's just dive into it. So white balance on auto. Of course, you have your daylight, shade, cloudy, blah, 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 blah. There's an auto white balance with a little fishy on it. So I imagine that's to correct for some of the green that you get underwater sometimes. And then we have priority set in auto white balance. So if we get into that we have standard, ambient, and white. So ambient will take warmer colors like incandescing, tungsten, indoor lighting and make that look warm, opposed to white, which will take any sort of warmer light and try to make it look like it's a white light. DRO and auto HDR, these are both things that really affect the JPEG, so I don't really care too much about it, but DRO is supposed to give you more dynamic range, so maybe that is something I should experiment with one day, see how good it is. And then we have auto HDR, which actually only works in JPEG mode. I'm in JPEG and RAW, so so that's why it's not enabled, but that will take multiple photos and combine 
it, just like HDR. Right now, I can't activate it because I'm in JPEG and RAW. It only works in JPEG mode. But if you're shooting JPEGs and you have your camera on a tripod, something that you might consider using. Creative style. This is where you would go to find your general looks like sepia. I remember when I used to think sepia was so cool. Never. I'm just gonna leave this on standard. Actually, I don't think it really even matters because I usually turn on a picture profile. So if you have those on, it basically disables your creative styles anyways. Now picture profile is really where I'm gonna wanna go to adjust my color for video. So you can go into a picture profile and customize it. So we have HLG2 for my gamma. Another popular one, S-Log2, Cine4, Movie. These are all popular options, but that could be its own video. You can change the color mode from 709 to BT2020. Definitely one of the things you really wanna to get to understand for videographers to maximize the capabilities of these cameras. I'm just gonna leave it off for now. Keep things simple. Then there's picture effects, which will give you a toy camera mode. Looks like it gives you a vignette and more contrast, a pop color and posturization, whoa. And a bunch of other stuff that I will never ever touch, but it's there if you want it. All right, next page, shutter auto white balance lock. If you're shooting auto white balance, do you want it to lock in after you halfway press the shutter or if you're shooting continuous? So with that enabled, when I half press the shutter, the white balance shouldn't change no matter what I aim it at. Focus magnifier, something you're gonna wanna program to one of the buttons because it's pretty useful, but what part of the frame do you wanna punch into? So I'm gonna select this part of the frame and very useful for manual focus right there. Focus magnification time, if I set it to two seconds and use the magnifier, it should pop back out automatically in two seconds and there we go. Initial focus magnification, if I set that to 5.9x when I activate the focus magnification, it automatically starts off punched in by 5.9x. But then if I have it just at one, it starts off with no punch in and then I can choose where to move that cursor and punch in like that. Next is autofocus and focus magnification. I like to have that on. So when I have my focus magnifier on, I have the option to use autofocus still. And then there's manual focus assist. So whenever I use manual focus, it should automatically punch in for me to help me hit that focus a little bit better. So I like having that on. Then there's peaking settings, which is a nice tool to use when you're pulling manual focus. It outlines the things that it detects as sharp or a lot of contrast, and you could put a color. And by default, I think it's white, but I have mine at red. But focus peaking is especially useful when you're using a small monitor like the one on the back of the screen. Next is face registration. So we have the fabulous Sam here. <laughs> We're gonna register some faces, so I'll start off with me. And would you like to register the face? Yes, please, registered, cool. New face, let's register Sam. Register. So now we can go in and change the order of priority. So let's say we mainly want shots of Sam. We'll put him up front there. Nice. And then we are going to activate registered faces priority. So you can see that at the right angles, it'll start registering our faces. What would be nice is if it had an option to take a lot of photos of one person's face. So then it can really understand what a person looks like. But I'm assuming that you could take several photos of the same person and that might make it a bit more reliable. It's in there if you want it. And finally, self-portrait timer. That's a nifty little feature. So even if you're just taking normal pictures on a regular drive mode, as soon as you turn this screen to selfie mode, it'll automatically activate a three second timer. So now we're gonna take a picture. Three, two, one. So you get that three second timer, which automatically goes away when you fold the screen back normally. Whoa, we finally made it to the next tab out of six. All right, moving on to the movie mode. All right, now we're talking my love language. All right, so we got exposure mode now. We have program auto, and then we have aperture priority. So you set your aperture, and then the shutter speed gets adjusted. And then there's shutter priority, which is the closest I get to shooting automatic. Basically, I set the shutter speed to 1 50th of a second, let's say, and then everything else is automatically adjusted. And then, of course, manual exposure, which is what I'm on the rest of the time. 
time. And then we have those same options in S and Q mode. So when we switch this dial to S and Q for slow-mo, then it's same type of deal. And then of course, file format. So AVCS 4K, and then we have HD and AVC HD for the smaller file sizes. But on this camera, for 4K on here is pretty solid. So I would leave it there. And then there's the record settings. So in this 4K codec, we have four options. Two of them are 30P and two of them are 24. I like to shoot 24 and each one has different bit rates. So 100 megabits per second or 60 megabits per second. I just go 100. I don't want the best quality coming out of here. If you're really short on space, then you could shoot 60. But then I wouldn't suggest shooting on a picture profile. Like if you're shooting no picture profile, you could probably get away with this. But try to do 100 megabits per second as much as you can. And this particular camera uses the full sensor when I'm shooting 24. But notice that there is no Super 35 option with the 30 piece. So those crop in slightly, not terribly, but this camera, there is a slight crop at 30p. Moving on to SNQ settings. Of course, we have our record settings. So what file format do we want our project to be at? Again, I'm shooting 24, so I want the project to be at 24. And then the frame rate that it will automatically jump to when I switch that dial. So for me, most of the time, I'm maximizing it out at 120 frames per second. And my record setting is at 24. But one thing to keep in mind about the SNQ switch is that you do record at a lower bit rate. After your clip is converted to slow-mo, you only have 12 megabits per second, opposed to when you dive into the menu, switch it from 4K to HD, and then set this to 120p, you have the option to 60 megabits per second, which is what the SNQ switch does, or 120p at 100 megabits per second. So that's actually gonna give you a higher resolution. Why the hell couldn't they give us the 100 megabit per second option in the S and Q switch? That would have made so much more sense. Like it looks like you have the option to change every little freaking thing in this camera, except for that, which is weird. You can also turn on proxy recording if you want. So when you're filming in the XAVC S codex, then it will create a secondary file for you. That's just more of a preview or proxy file. Something that could be useful in some cases, but I generally just edit the native 4K files. So I'm just gonna leave that off. Next page, auto drive speed. So you can have it drive fast, normal, or slow. So the manual suggests using fast for something like shooting sports. And then normal is kind of your default. And then slow is when you want your focus to rack smoothly. And then autofocus is tracking sensitivity. I might actually jump that over to responsive. Why not? This mode's pretty self-explanatory. This mode is useful when recording movies in which the subject is moving very quickly. And then auto slow shutter is really only useful if you're shooting in auto setting or aperture value, but basically it slows down your shutter when it gets dark. But I personally never let the camera decide what the shutter speed is going to be. I always like to lock that in. So not really a feature I care about initial focus magnification same thing as before we can have it start off at 1x or immediately punch into 4x and then audio recording level sets your audio level so depending on what mic you put in there and how loud your environment is you want to adjust that moving on to audio level display yes we want that display on our screen monitoring your audio levels very important audio out timing so when you have hdmi coming out of this camera there's a slight slight lag in the image so if you have the audio audio out to live that will send out the audio immediately as fast as the camera can process it because it can process the audio faster than it can process the video right but then if you have lip sync it kind of delays the audio slightly so it will match up to the monitor and then there's wind noise reduction which only affects the internal microphone if you plug in an external microphone like I usually do this does not matter now let's move on to marker display and marker settings these are related so let's go into our settings first First, you can have a marker on the center. You can have your aspect ratio. So if you want ultra widescreen, like 235 by one, and then you could turn on marker display and then you could see all that stuff appear on the back of your camera. And then movie with shutter, I like to have that on. So if you're in movie mode, you can hit the shutter button and it'll start recording a video. Nice touch. Next phase, we have silent shooting. So when you take a picture, it sounds like this, but then you turn silent shooting on and it sounds like this. And then there's E front curtain shutter. What is that? 
I have no idea. That is why I have a manual here. Okay, so with it on, there's a shorter lag between when you hit that shutter to when the photo gets taken. But the downside is if you're shooting fast shutter speed, the brightness may become uneven. The bokeh effect might get cut off because of the shutter mechanism that it kind of sees for a split second. So I don't even know how much of a lag difference it is. Like honestly, the shutter feels perfectly fine to me. So the lag difference must be so small. I'd rather just have it off and not have to worry about it. Next is the release without lens. So that's your shutter or filming videos. Do you wanna be able to do it even if it doesn't recognize the lens? I always leave that enabled because if you put on some manual lenses, cameras don't recognize it. And it's really annoying when you're trying to hit record and it's like, actually we can't because we don't detect the lens. So I leave that on release without card. I don't know why you would want to release without down card, maybe to see a sample image or something. I've been trying to get in the habit of just like, as soon as I'm done downloading, I try to put it straight back in the camera. Steady shot on or off. And in this camera, the A6600, there's IBIS in here. So it enables that as well as optical stabilization inside this lens here. And then there's steady shot settings where I just leave it on auto. I guess in some very particular circumstances, you can set it to manual, but you have to tell it what focal length that it's gonna be shooting in. So I'm just gonna switch that to auto and let the lens do the communicating with the camera and take care of that for me so I don't mess anything up. And then we have some zoom options here. So if we go into our settings, there's optical zoom only, clear image zoom, which doesn't digitally scale up things bigger than it needs to be. So that's kind of cool. And then digital zoom, which will blow up your pixels. So I would refrain from using digital zoom. So clear image zoom might be a good option. Like zooming with your lenses is the best, but if you need to go past that, you can just use that little digital push right there. Moving on to the display button. So between your monitor and finder, how many options do you want in here? And same with the viewfinder on the back of this camera. And then finder and monitor, it's gonna show us the monitor, but when I put my eye up to the viewfinder, it's going to recognize it automatically and switch to the viewfinder, but you can manually lock it into just monitor or viewfinder, which can be pretty useful because if you're trying to use the monitor, sometimes you put your hand close to the eyepiece, it'll start switching back and forth when you don't want it to. So sometimes it's nice to lock it into one or the other. And then there's finder frame rate. So for your viewfinder, what frame rate do you want it to be on? Standard or high? When you set this to high, the viewfinder will look smoother, but the manual says that it will lower the resolution. So something to keep in mind. Zebra displays are nice. It shows you when you're overexposed. You could also set how sensitive the zebras are. So the lower you set this, the earlier the zebras will show up. I generally like to have mine around 90. And then grid lines if you want a rule of thirds grid, a square grid, diagonal plus square grid. I like to just leave it off. I like to keep it pretty clean. Exposure set guide, you can turn it on or off. See, when I change the shutter speed, see how there's that big black bar that kind of goes and it scrolls past, but if I turn it off, that bar is no longer there. You can just see the adjustments being made on the bottom. I think I'm gonna leave it off. I don't really need this thing on. Although when I accidentally bump it, it does kind of let you know, hey, you're changing your settings. So maybe I will leave it on, I don't know. Moving right along to live view display. Setting effect on or off, live view, what? is this? Oh, okay, this makes sense. So when you have it on, it's gonna show you what the exposure is going to look like. So when I really overexpose, obviously it looks really bad and I know right away I'm doing something wrong. But if I turn it off, then the footage is always gonna be smooth, but at the same time, I have no idea what my exposure is gonna look like until I get the shot, which will look very blown out. So this feels more like you're looking through an actual viewfinder, which might be good for some people. I think I prefer to see how bad my exposure is going to be before I take that picture. So I'll leave that on and auto review after you take a picture. Do you want it to auto review? Sure. So now if I take a picture, it will show me that image for two seconds at the current setting. Now onto the custom keys. Up top, we have custom key for photo, video, and playback. So every time you switch between photo, video, and playback, Playback, the custom buttons on your camera will all change. So since I really only shoot video, I will be going in here and customizing the heck 
out of all these buttons to do exactly what I want. First thing I'm gonna program in is that focus magnifier right there up top. So when I'm shooting video and I wanna manually focus, I just hit that, boom, punch in right away, so much easier. Now one thing that's kinda cool is setting one of your buttons to change the dials and what they do. So I have my dial two programmed into my C4 button, what am I even talking about here? Let me show you. My dial settings will go into there and see how I have my second dial here programmed in. Up top is the white balance color temperature and down below it is the audio record level. So basically what that means is if I go back into camera mode, when I turn the dial, it changes the shutter speed right now, right? Check this out. If I hold down the C4 button, see how the dial star two pops up? That means my dials are are changed. So now I can actually turn the wheel and instead of changing the shutter speed, now I can dial my white balance and also my audio recording level. So that is actually very, very nifty. So definitely worth spending some time here to customize your keys and then your function menu set. So this menu here is what pops up when you hit the function button on the back of your camera. So if I'm in video mode and I hit that, that same thing pops up right here. And again, I'm a video guy so I would actually swap out a lot of this stuff for video features that way I can access it a little bit quicker how about steady shot that way I can toggle it on and off pretty quickly so very easy access to my steady shot now so these five things right here spend time there program in all your quick access items and then finally dial and wheel setup right now I have one set to aperture the other set to time value or basically your shutter speed but you can flip flop it if you want. And then off to the next page, AV TV rotate. That basically means your dials, you can reverse them if you want to. They just give you options to change everything. I feel like they should almost have like an advanced menu and they should hide a lot of this crap in there because this is almost too much. But I guess on the other hand, once you get everything dialed in and set up all your custom buttons, you never really have to dive back into this menu that often. But I will say the first time you pick up the camera and start dialing through this, it is overwhelming. And then there's dial and wheel EV compensation. So you can set either your wheel or your dial to one of those. But if you're shooting manual, doesn't really matter. Now, when it comes to function of touch operation, you have touch shutter, touch focus, and touch tracking. Basically, when you touch the LCD back here, what do you want the camera to do? And then we could go to movie button. So you can set this to always or movie mode only. So there is a little red dot here. That's your record button. Do you want it to always trigger record? recording a movie or only in movie mode. So if you take a lot of photographs, rarely shoot videos, you might wanna just make it movie mode only so you're not accidentally bumping into it. But again, I'm a video guy, I want it to always be there. And then there's dial and wheel lock. I have it enabled on lock right there. So I can basically press and hold the function button, I think for something like five seconds and it will lock the dials for me to get out of it. Guess what? You press and hold the function button again unlock there we go if you don't care for that feature you can turn it off and then finally audio signals do you want your cameras to make all kinds of beeps and stuff or do you want it to be quiet i like it to be quiet so let's turn that off oh man we made it to the third tab guys i need another nap and by nap i mean go to sleep for another 12 hours i'll be back tomorrow and the saga continues. I feel like that moment in Jumanji when Robin Williams pops out of the game for the first time and he's like, what year is it? I feel like my brain has been trapped inside of this complex menu. And with the quarantine, I feel like my days are all mixed up. I have no idea what time or day it is. But today will be the day we complete this expedition. Yeah, that's the word to describe this. Going through an expedition. What is that? Actually, am I using that word right? A journey or voyage undertaken by a group of people with a particular purpose, especially that exploration, scientific research, or war. This is exactly it. Expedition. That's what we're doing. All right, we made it to the network. Sent to smartphone function. So there's an app that you can sync up to called Play Memories, and it has a 1.1 star rating on the app store out of five. <laughs> I'm trying to download it and I'm trying to sign up, but it's giving me all these error messages. So I can't even create an account right now. I'm just gonna, you know what, forget it. But apparently you can send photos and videos to your phone through the app if you want to. Next item, send to computer 
computer. Same type of thing, except for to your computer, you can install Play Memories Home on your computer and register the access point, set up a broadband router, blah, 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 and send pictures to your computer. View on TV. Apparently you can view images on a network enabled TV wirelessly. You can use this function on a TV that supports DLNA renderer, but movies cannot be shown on a TV via Wi-Fi, so you have to use the HDMI cable sold separately, so I would never do this. Next is control with a smartphone if you wanna wirelessly control the camera via Wi-Fi. Next is airplane mode. Had no idea this camera had that setting, so whoops for all the times I flew with this camera without turning that on. Then there's Wi-Fi settings. There's the WPS push, access point set, display MAC address, SSID, PW reset. No idea what any of that means. Wi-Fi stuff gives me a headache. I guess it's kind of cool that there's all these wireless options on this camera, but really, I think I'm just gonna pull out the memory card, stick it in, do it old school. And aside from Wi-Fi, there is also Bluetooth settings. For what exactly? No idea. So Bluetooth apparently is used to connect to a smartphone or Bluetooth remote commander via Bluetooth connection. I like that, remote commander. It's not a remote controller, it's a commander. And then there's location info link set. So if you hook this up to your phone, you can automatically have it update your camera on the location info and then auto time correct, which is kind of nice and auto area adjust. Why is there an auto area adjust and location info? What is the difference between those two? Uh, how about we just skip this for now? <laughs> Bluetooth remote control can be used with a remote commander, RMT P1BT, which is sold separately if you wanna use that. And then there's edit device name. Oh, okay, let's do this. Po oh my God, this is gonna take a long time. Potate, I'll just go with that. That's gonna take too long. <laughs> so my camera's name is now Potat. Potat, almost sounds like a dirty word, doesn't it? Why don't you stick this up your potat? <laughs> we'll be like, what? And then finally, reset network settings. So if you go and just screw all these settings up like I probably just did, then you can go here and fix it up. Next, oh, we're moving right along. We have protect right here. We can protect multiple images. We're all with this date, but you can still reformat your card with this protect feature on. So don't trust it all the way. Rotate, rotate your images, delete, delete an image. And then there's rating, so you can rate your photos if you feel like managing all that inside the camera, although I would much rather do it on the computer afterwards. Rating set, so you can set how many stars there are. You can rate it from one to five, but depending on your workflow, you can have it only show you three options or whatever. This is a lot of control of this thing. And then you could also specify printing. So in camera, you're like, oh, I really wanna print this shot afterwards. You can start selecting them here. I wonder how many people actually utilize this feature. I mean, I feel like most people just go to their computer and do it all there. Then there's photo capture, which is basically like a screen capture. So if you have a video clip and you want to extract one frame out of it, you can on your camera. And then you can enlarge image, activate this to take a closer look at one of the photos you've already taken. This can be a handy feature when you're trying to check if you got that focus right. And then enlarge initial magnification. So every time you enlarge your image, does it just enlarge it the standard amount or does it go to the previous magnification amount and then enlarge initial position. So when you punch into an image, does it just punch into the center or does it go into the focused position? Next is continuous PB for interval. PB stands for playback. And then you can also change the playback speed for interval shooting. So these are two items that are for a very specific purpose, which is when you wanna play back your interval shooting images, but without having to touch it, it just kind of plays on its own. Two menu items for that very specific use case. That's how you end up with a menu that's huge. Then there's slideshow. If you wanna go through your images, you can set it to repeat off or on, and then interval how fast you want it to sort through the images. I mean, I guess if you just finished doing a shoot and you're eating lunch or something, you wanna set the camera up and you wanna watch the photos on this teeny little display while you're eating or something, I don't know. All right, now there's view mode. So you have different ways to view your images. Next is our image index. Now you have the option between 12 images and 30 images. So how big do you want the images to appear 
when you're in that calendar mode. Display as group, I have it on. So basically every time I take photos in burst mode or interval mode, it kind of stacks it into one item. That way when you're scrolling through your picture, you don't have to scroll through 800 images every time you go on burst mode. And then you have display rotation. You could have it set to auto, manual or off. So when you're looking at some portrait images, if you're on auto, it'll automatically flip for you. And then if you have it on manual, then all vertical images will appear to be vertical on the screen and won't change even if you rotate your camera or you could just turn it off so everything's fully manual. Image jump settings. You could set this to either your dial or your control wheel and you can select your image jump methods. So one by one only or protect only or all the different star ratings or whatever. So this can kind of help you navigate around a little bit faster if you're organized like that. Next is monitor brightness. I always have mine set to sunny, which is the brightest setting. And then viewfinder brightness, same type of deal, just the brightness in the viewfinder. And then viewfinder color temperature, you could slightly adjust that if needed. I've never touched it. And then there's gamma display assist. So so if you're shooting in S-Log, then this is kind of like applying a LUT to it. This does not get baked into your shot. This is just for reference. So you're not looking at a flat image on the back of your screen. So that is nice. Volume settings. And then there's delete confirm. Another one of those settings where if you really, really want to change every little aspect of your camera, you can get into this. You can select either delete first or cancel first. So if I'm looking through some images, I want to delete that. See how it goes to cancel first. And then I go up and then hit delete. The other way, you could have it pop to delete first. See, another very subtle change to your camera that is another menu item. It's starting to make sense why this menu is so insane. It's because there's so many settings you can change. Honestly, I think going through all this stuff is like mental effort that is exhausting, that doesn't need to happen. But I don't know, some of you guys tell me, is it these features that you actually want or does it just make the menu more complicated? Because when you pick up a camera for the first time and you start doing things, you see all these settings, you go, oh crap, there's more stuff to think about, there's more stuff to learn. You know what I should do next is like, go through the Area Lexus menu next, because that thing is really, really well designed. It's very intuitive. You turn it on for the first time, even if you don't know what the hell you're doing, you can figure it out pretty quick and you can feel pretty confident about the settings. Like with this camera, I feel like I'm more confused now than I was when I started. Like seriously, like some settings have changed on the camera and I'm not 100% sure how to switch it back. Oh man. Next up, display quality. You can change that between standard and high. I imagine we want high, right? There's gotta be a catch to it. So when it's on high, it will use more battery faster. And also when the temperature of the camera rises, this setting may become locked to standard. Next is power save start time. How fast do you want your power save to kick in? Next is auto power off temperature. Most people have it on standard. By default, I set mine to high so that it doesn't cut on me in case it gets really hot. But I imagine standard will do a better job at protecting your camera. And then there's NTSC and PAL selector. So depending on where you are, you would set this accordingly. And then there's cleaning mode, which apparently vibrates the sensor to get some of the dust particles off. So let's give it a shot. Oh, you feel it vibrate a little bit and auto cleaning is finished. Nice. Next is touch operation. Yes, I want my screen to have a touch screen. Yes, please. So touch panel is essentially your touch screen and then touch pad is when you have your eye up to the viewfinder, you can still use the touch pad back here to help you select your focus marks. It's actually pretty useful. So I definitely like to have them both enabled and touch pad settings, you can have it. So does it work in vertical orientation? The reason why you might wanna turn it off is because your cheek is more likely to bump into it. But if that doesn't bother you, leave it on. And then you have touch position mode. And in touch position mode, you have absolute position and also relative. So absolute basically means if you have your eye up to the viewfinder, if you touch the top right hand of the screen, then the focus will always go to the top right. But relative position is more like a trackpad on a laptop where you kind of scroll around your position. So you can kind of swipe like that to move it around. I kind of like having it absolute. So whenever I touch a certain part of the screen, I know 
know exactly where that focus is gonna get. And then there's operation area of the touchpad. So a lot of times when you have your eye up to the viewfinder, your cheek is also touching the screen. So if you don't want that to be an issue, then you can select exactly what part of the touchpad is sensitive. I like to just have it be right half because usually the left half is where my cheek would touch. So demo mode is more for stores, but it basically plays back certain clips that you have on your memory card after it's been sitting idle for a little bit. And then there's time code and UB settings. So you can manually punch in your time code or just jam it with the audio jack. Next is IR remote control. So that is for infrared remote controls instead of Bluetooth. I'm sorry, not the remote controller, the remote commander. And then there's HDMI settings. You can set your resolution manually or auto and then your output HDMI info display. So, so do you want your external monitor to be able to see your settings a little more? Time code output. So record control basically allows the camera to send a signal to the external recorder or player and command the recorder or player to start and stop recording using the camera. So I definitely want that on. If I hit record on the camera, then it will start recording on an external recorder. And then there's control for HDMI, which is something that you use if you have it connected to a Bravia sync compatible TV using an HDMI cable. And you can operate this product by aiming the TV remote control at the TV. Again, another very specific menu item there. And then there's 4K output select, another feature you would use only if you're connected to a external recorder. Do you want your 4K clips to be recorded onto the memory card as well as to the HDMI recording device or just HDMI only at 30p or 24? And then there's USB connection, how this camera reacts when you plug it via USB into a computer. USB lens settings, I have no clue, but there's multi and single. I read the manual on this and I still have no clue what it's for. But apparently if you're having USB compatibility issues, then you can drop that to single, but otherwise leave it on multi. And then there's USB power supply. So if you want to hook this up to a external battery pack or something and have that charge the camera while you're recording. Although in my experiences, it still discharges a little bit faster than it pulls the power. So even if you have USB plugged into here, powering it, the camera still can die on you. It just takes a lot longer for that battery to drain. Next up, PC remote settings. Basically, when you have your camera tethered to your computer, do you want it to save to just the computer or also to the internal memory? And then there's language. Most of you probably have it set to English or French or Italian. I have it set to this. So there you go. Oh crap, did I just screw myself up? Where was that setting? That was just a joke, guys. I don't actually know how to read any of this. Uh, was it here? Yes. Oh, man. Perfect. Good thing I know this menu really, really well now. Next is date and time setup. I don't think I have to tell you guys how to set this up. And then there's area settings, which looks like time zone. Oh, that's what area settings are. Okay, so earlier when we mentioned area settings, I was super confused. It's basically your time zone. Okay, got it. And then there's copyright info if you want some of that on the metadata. And then there's format. If you want to format your memory card, don't really want to do that yet. And then for your file number, there's a series or reset and then set file name. You can adjust that. So does that mean I can set all my files to be pot? Oh, it's only limited to three characters. So the files will be POTS01234. And I deliver files on this camera. Clients are gonna be like, is he stoned? Select record folder. Basically, where do you want your folders to go? And you can also create a new folder. And then there's folder name, which is standard form, or you could also set it by date. That's actually useful. I would like that. Recover image database. If something goes funky with your memory card, this will try to correct it. And then there's display media info tells me I have two hours, 39 minutes in movie mode and then version number. Finally, setting reset, which will just completely undo all the changes I have done. And then finally, this is the my menu. So out of all the things that we talked about, you can use these to customize your favorite things and you can plot them right here so that you never have to go through all this crap again. Oh gosh, are we finally done? Now I know the full Sony menu and you guys do too. You could seriously customize the crap out of this camera. 
camera. Get it exactly how you want it. So if you want to do the deep dive and set your camera up exactly how you want it, then I could see how some of this stuff is useful. But geez, that took so long. How long is this freaking video? Oh my God, I can't believe you guys are still watching. That was nuts. Like, you know how people are always saying that Sony menus are the worst? I think that's just because of how many options that they give you right there in the menu. So even if you're a beginner, first time picking up a Sony camera, you go through the menu and naturally you go, I need to make sure I set all these things correctly. But then you look through and there's all this stuff that doesn't totally make sense right away. And I feel like what would help is if they were to hide a lot of these super intricate settings into like an advanced folder or something like that. But holy cow, that was draining. Whew. Whew. Exits this way. I don't know why I went that way.